Dick, thanks for agreeing to do this interview with me. Hey, you're welcome, Guy. As some in our global audience may not know of you and your work, please let me read a short introduction before we start. Richard E. Clark is Professor Emeritus of Educational Psychology and Technology, a clinical professor of surgery, and has served as co-director of the Center for Cognitive Technology at the University of Southern California. Before going to USC, he was a faculty member in psychology and education at Stanford and at Syracuse University. Dick is also the CEO of Atlantic Training in Los Angeles. He is the author of over 300 published articles and book chapters, and his books include Handling Complexity in Learning Environments, Research and Theory from 2006, Turning Research into Results, A Guide to Selecting the Right Performance Solutions from 2008, Learning from Media, Arguments, Analysis, and Evidence, Second Edition, 2012, Learning Analytics in Education, 2018. He and his work have won numerous awards, including in 2013, the USC Faculty Lifetime Achievement Award. He has also won the Thomas F. Gilbert Distinguished Professional Achievement Award from ISPI, the International Society for Performance and Improvement, the 2010 Tallheimer Neon Elephant Award for Bridging the Gap Between Science and Practice, the Socrates Award for Excellence in Teaching from the Graduate Students at USC, and the Outstanding Civilian Service Award from the U.S. Army for his work in distance learning. Dr. Clark's interest in the design and application of research on complex learning, performance, motivation, and the use of technology in instruction. Dick is an elected fellow of the American Psychological Association, Division 15, Educational Psychology, and a fellow in the Association of Applied Psychology, and a founding fellow of the American Psychological Society. He's currently working on a new book, but we will talk about that a little bit later, hopefully, and uh, four reasons good employees lose motivation. This was his HBR article with Roar Saxberg. Dick, let's start our interview off with, what do you think of the current state of the L&D profession? Well, well, there's good news and bad news like there is with most things. I think the good news is that there's an amazing amount of research out there to be applied. Um, especially in the last decade, I think. And secondly, I think there are many more people advocating it seriously and putting a great effort into it. I mean, a good example of that is Will Fallheimer's worklearning.com. Uh, yourself, Guy, what you've been doing, their learning engineering approach that's online now. There's a bunch of learning engineers that are getting together from different fields. That's exciting. Um, and the second thing is that um, uh, there's some bad news. And the bad news, I think, is that we have no professional associations that really support evidence-based work, I think, in L&D. Uh, no coordination of effort, no cert certifications, uh, no L&D models that are favored. Most of the L&D models that are favored by professional associations are not evidence-based. And I think that most of the university programs that train L&Ders are not evidence-based either. So those two things, uh, the good things do not outweigh the bad things at this point, I think. Well, the quick answer is nearly all of it. <laughs> um, there are exceptions, of course, but the exceptions don't make a rule. You know, there's just huge benefits out there if people paid more attention to this, both for people that do L&D, that offer their services in that area, and for, for their clients, most particularly for the clients. For example, if, you were, if, if people to adopt this new evidence-based cognitive task analysis, this front-end analysis, and if they were to adopt the new guided learning or direct learning, it's called the more evidence-based of the new training design systems, the evidence is that you get about a 35% increase in learning. You get a 25% decrease on average in time to learn, a 50% reduction in errors after training, 
an increase in self-confidence, motivation for the job, more durable learning, it lasts longer, there's increased transfer to the job, I mean, you could go on and on. It, there are true benefits out there that are cost sensitive and produce huge income, mostly on the side of people who are trained. Got a lot of people going through training, it's a very big extent, and um, doing it quicker, doing it better, doing it more long lasting is certainly a benefit. Uh, the second area I think that hasn't been put into practice much is motivation. That actually is a bigger area of need. 40% of performance is motivationally based, the evidence is. And there are some new evidence-based motivation models out there. You mentioned the one in the Harvard Business Review article that we published here a year or so ago. That got a lot of attention. But, you know, finally, I think we really need a lot more research on how to summarize research and format it in a way that is meaningful and understandable to people who are the clients for this sort of thing. Well, um, I really like the new data analytics stuff that's going on. It's also called big data work where people are analyzing keystrokes in online training and in L&D activities and businesses. And they have tens of thousands of people that are in these studies. And they're gonna get new insights, I think, about what's going on out there. And that actually needs to be put into practice as soon as possible. Um, in training design, I, there's a book out there, a new book by Neelan and Kirshner called Evidence to Inform Learning Design. I think it's very good. Uh, worth reading, certainly, on what's there that hasn't been put into practice. Could have done a better job on task analysis, but other than that, it's really excellent. Um, there's an approach called fully guided learning that is really valuable, that has huge impact, and it replaces something called discovery learning, which doesn't really work all that well, I think. Uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive task analysis uh, that's evidence-based as front-end analysis, that is the anal analysis of what experts are doing, what they don't know that they don't know, more or less. Um, I, I could go on and on. I, I think that the list of things that we should put into practice right now is very, very long and very powerful. Well, I just a couple more things just really quick. Rich Mayer at Santa Barbara has done a huge amount of work in how to do online instruction. Anybody doing online, making videos, doing anything with media in training and learning and design really needs to take a look at his work. Um, so basically, there's a huge amount out there that we're not using. It's not just one or two things. It's a great number of them. Well, that's a hard one to feel you could take tackle in a very sharp return. Let's, let's take a few of them. I had a CEO last week of a huge company that does L&D, proud that his designers had adopted Bloom's taxonomy. <clears throat> 50 years old, basically irrelevant and wrong. And yet it's just being adopted in a lot of places. Uh, discovery learning. Uh, a belief that just letting people on their own, uh, you know, motivated people, give them a problem, they'll solve it, they'll be able to work on it. The, I think the best example of that is the John Seeley Brown communities of practice, he calls them. It doesn't work. It works for 10% of people in LND. What about the other 90? You know, it's, they're in trouble usually with it. Game-based learning. It doesn't work. I mean, the evidence is huge that it only works when game people do the research. When anybody else takes a look, it doesn't really make all that much difference. It's intended and, and intentions are good. It's to motivate people, I think. Uh, subject matter experts as trainers. 90% of the trainers in the world, live trainers, are subject matter experts. And yet the evidence is they leave out 70% of what people know in order to tackle the same tasks that the expert does so well but actually doesn't know that she or he knows how to do those things. Learning styles, the old saw. Uh, there are no learning styles. There are no visual, verbal, haptic, uh, Myers-Briggs. None of that stuff works. I'm sorry. Uh, what does work is that there's some APA, American Psychological Association, has something called the Big Five. That works. Prior knowledge of things that somebody's going to learn and have to use at work, that, that's important. 
but learning styles, no. Oh, here's another one. Millennials, digital natives, all these ways to group people by generation don't work. Go look at the evidence for it if you think they do. I mean, they're, it's exciting stuff, but it doesn't work basically. Uh, reaction forms for training and evaluation, um, that doesn't work. The list is fairly long. I think that's the nice thing about that book by uh, Neil and, and Kirshner, is that they have a complete list of these myths and so on. And uh, good thing to read. And then if you doubt that evidence, go take a look. <laughs>